In this lecture on topics in environmental economics, Dr. Pete Schumann presents an overview of non-market valuation methods and the data needed to use them in the case of environmental goods and services. He starts by presenting definitions of value and valuation and notes the differences between willingness to pay and willingness to accept, as well as between cost and gain. He notes that in the context of environmental goods and services for which there might or might not be a market, there are a range of market and non-market valuation approaches that can help generate common units of measure and comparisons for decision making. He highlights market-based methods of valuation like replacement cost and damage avoidance, and non-market revealed preference models, travel cost, random utility modeling, and hedonic pricing. He notes the need for biophysical data that can be translated into indicators that can be meaningfully valued by people. Uh, quick outline. What is economic value? Categories of value, some misconceptions. We've already covered some of this stuff. Benefit cost analysis, little introduction introduction to some methods, applications. I'll go light on the applications and save those for tomorrow and, and Wednesday. Benefits of conducting evaluation exercise. I'm actually gonna sneak that up to the beginning. Say we put the punchline at, at, at the beginning and then it'll all be coasting downhill from there. Obstacles, gaps and unknowns, suggestion for a way forward. Here we go. Now uh, we've talked about this. What is economic value? Uh, not just what you actually pay, but also what you are willing to pay, what you're willing to give up. If you pay $25 for a snorkel trip, but you get $100 worth of enjoyment, well, that the value of that trip is not $25, it's $100. Uh, and valuation simply means estimating what something is worth. Usually in dollars, we call that monetary valuation. That's, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so willingness, willingness to pay. We've covered this. Value is anthropocentric. Uh, valuation is utilitarian. We, we've covered this as well. This is a, a point that we could debate the, the anthropo anthropocentric perspective on value. Um, pros and cons of that perspective, I guess. The big pro is that we, we really don't have a choice um, other than to try and measure value to people. Um, I, d I, don't, I don't know that we can measure value to plants and animals. We, we can measure that people care about plants and animals, but it's very difficult to understand what plants and animals themselves value. Um, the downside, of course, is that our, our, our uh, knowledge of <coughs> the usefulness of natural systems is, is limited at best. Willingness to accept, another notion of value. Right? Oftentimes we lose something of value, and, there, and therefore the the, the, the proper valuation metric is, is either willingness to pay to avoid that loss or willingness to accept the amount that you would need to be compensated uh, in order to, be, to made whole, be made whole again for the loss of something. Common misconceptions. Again, these, we've, we've covered a lot of these in our discussions already, which is nice to see. But uh, economic value and economic activity are not the same thing. Right? The amount of money that changes hands is often confused with economic value. They're not synonyms. Um, the amount of money that changes hands can be, can be completely different from value. Right? They don't account for opportunity costs, foregone alternatives. They don't account for non-market goods, goods and services that we place real economic value on that aren't traded in markets. Cost, same, same idea, right? Cost and value are, are not the same. What you pay for something is not always a great reflection of the value. It, it can be. Uh, Example, it would cost an awful lot of money to move sand from Colorado to the Sahara, but the value of that move would be very low. At the same time, you can pay a price for something and actually value it much more than you actually pay. Value is not just revealed in markets, right? Non-market goods and services, clean air, clean water, healthy ecosystems give us real value. Is it tougher to measure? Absolutely. Broken window fallacy. Uh, another idea about value. Or wars are natural disasters good uh, for an economy, right? There's a huge upswing in economic activity after a hurricane. Does that mean that a hurricane was good? Well, no, of course not, right? The money that was spent recovering from that disaster could have been used for something else. Those aren't necessarily new jobs that were created, opportunity costs. All right, so I went quickly through that with purpose because we've, we've covered a lot of these uh, issues already. Value is what something is worth. Cost and value, the amount of money spent, are not necessarily synonymous with value. Value takes place outside of markets. And we've got to think about opportunity costs. All right, so trade-offs. Right? Trade-offs are a fact of life. 
We get real economic value from market goods. We also get real economic value from natural resources, environmental goods and services. We can argue that the entire market economy depends on proper functioning of natural systems. Ecosystem services, right? We've, we've all seen this, some version of this uh, enumeration of services that natural systems give us, supporting services, provisioning, cultural, regulating services. This all provides contributions to our well-being. All right, so they're obviously important, but they're often ignored by policymakers, by the general public. Uh, why? Why are they ignored? Well, maybe because of market failures, which we've covered, right? Two common market failures. Markets don't provide these goods. Characteristics of public goods allow for free riders. Right? External costs created by production and consumption of the goods are not reflected in the market prices, so the market's not sending us a proper signal about the value of those goods. So since markets don't provide these goods, their value goes unmeasured, often unnoticed. So if we can try to understand the value of these resources, maybe we can uh, better understand the trade-offs that, that we're making. Total economic value has a lot of pieces. Use value and non-use value is one way to partition value, right? Things that we use either directly through extraction or uh, directly without extraction, maybe snorkeling or hiking or mountain biking, right? That would be non-extractive use value. Extractive use value, that's, that's physically extracting the resource from its in-situ in state. Indirect use values, we get direct, uh, indirect uses from ecosystem services. Uh, some folks will categorize indirect use values, ecosystem service values as, as passive use or non-use. Um, uh, partitioning these into well-defined buckets isn't really critical, just that we acknowledge that, hey, there are lots of different components of value. Non-use values. We can value things that we don't actually interact with in any way. Right? We like knowing that species and ecosystems are protected. Right? So we can value things without use, direct or indirect. How do we know that those non-use values are real? This is an interesting point of discussion. What, what evidence do we have that people place real economic value, keeping in mind willingness to pay, willingness to accept is sort of our our measures, how do we know that people value things that they don't see, and they don't touch? What do we do? What's our, what are some examples of things that? Donate to NGOs. Yeah, there you go. A monetary donation to World Wildlife Fund. We do have evidence that people are willing to trade. People are willing to trade time, money, energy for things that they don't, <coughs> that they don't see, they don't touch. All right, so understanding, measuring, monetizing, environmental contributions to human well-being is the domain of valuation, economic valuation. Uh, important caveats right at the beginning. Valuation does not establish absolute values for the environment. Oftentimes we can only measure that which we understand, uh, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, the more obvious and measurable benefits. Um, so we usually just get lower bounds. Um, I, I guess another thing to keep in mind is that Economists just don't go around valuing things willy-nilly for no reason. I don't sit in my office and say, I wonder what the value of whales is. I'm going to develop a valuation study to figure that out. We, we, we try to place values on things when there's a reason, right? when there's a trade-off that's coming, uh, a policy decision that, that needs information about values. Right? If we could not do valuation, we wouldn't do it. But oftentimes, there are trade-offs where values are necessary, at least useful to understand. All right, so why? What are the benefits? Why would we do this? Several reasons come to mind. First, it, it, Jim, Jim talked about this earlier, having a common unit of measure, right? And being able to compare apples to apples, right? Market goods are going to have dollar values associated with them, right? Maybe a development project is we're going to have dollar values on jobs. We're going to have dollar values on revenues. On the other side of the scale, we've got non-market values for the most part, right? It, to know whether the costs outweigh the benefits or vice versa, it's, it's nice to have a common unit of measure. Helps us do objective decision making, right? Facilitates easy comparison when everything's in monetary units. Valuation provides a nice input to cost-benefit analysis, right? Sort of the same, same idea, right? It's 
Cost-benefit analysis is not the only thing that informs the policy decision. We also want to think about political feasibility, fairness, budget constraints, cultural concerns, time constraints. Uh, it's just one input. Make comparisons. Understand trade-offs that we're being asked to make. Non-market valuation can call attention to otherwise overlooked natural resources. Right? Policymakers might only focus on jobs and revenues, obvious values. Valuation reminds everyone that all the environment is free. Ask an economist if there's any th such thing as free. There's no such thing as free. Even though it's free, uh, that definitely does not mean that it's not very valuable. All right, so th and, then, and then finally, the incidence of costs and benefits. A well-designed valuation study uh, will allow us to see who gains and who loses so we can consider equity. We can also consider timing, right? So not just the uh, distribution of costs and benefits in society, but also the intertemporal distribution of costs and benefits. OK, so how does it work? How does non-market valuation work? Um, we need a link. Uh, we need a link between the changes in the quality or quantity of natural resources and people, what people say or what people do. Right? If, change, uh, if air quality changes, people might move. Right? There's a link. Uh, if beaches are dirty, people might go to a different beach. Right? There's, there's a link between behavior and changes in the environment. And we're going to try and use that link to tell us what people value. Uh, we have a lot of techniques uh, available. Right? And they can be used for use values and non-use values. And they're constantly being refined, constantly being improved. And so I took this same little delineation of value categories, and I added some methods general categories of methods to the right, right? If we have extractive use values, the chances are we can use market data. Uh, we're extracting resources most often to sell in a market. Non-extractive use values, perhaps we can use revealed preference methods. People's behaviors are going to reveal what they value. Um, indirect use values are, are probably the toughest um, in a lot of ways. We'll, we'll talk about those. Uh, and then your non-use values are also very, very difficult, right? Because people don't have to do anything to value natural resources. Lots of components of value, so oftentimes we need to use more than one method. Um, no single method is, is likely to uh, be able to address all the values that might be contained in a, in a natural resource or ecosystem service. And that's OK. Some scenarios, this is you know, just three of, of you know, dozens that we, could, that we could put up on the board. Uh, assess the potential for user fees. Are people willing to pay more? Uh, for environmental friendly products or experiences. Natural resource damage assessment, right? What is, what is the damage, uh, what is the value of damage? This could be from natural change, it could be from you know, incidental change, anything, right? How much, how much value is lost? Complete cost benefit analysis of development project or conservation project, right? It's a good idea or not. OK, there's, there are some market-based valuation methods. Right? And the basic idea, and I'm going to try and give you the basic idea and the empirical approach for each of these, sparing you the technical details, which I'd be happy to share with you any time. Um, but there is a very deep body of literature on the technical details that, that, that you can turn to. Um, the basic idea is that market transactions do give us at least a lower bound on, on value. Right? If you paid the price, then we can make a pretty good guess that it was worth that amount to you. OK, so this is for mostly for extractive use values, but we can use market prices and quantities uh, to, to understand, understand value. Right? Commercial fisheries harvests are, are a good example of this. Right? The pros, uh, relative ease of calculation. The data is, is often available. Um, defensible, very defensible value estimates. Right? We, they're, they're grounded in market behavior. Uh, the cons, though, they'd only apply to, to certain types of value. And it's hard to get a true sense of net gains, right? If value is what something is worth in terms of what you'd be willing to pay, uh, market transactions are awfully, often only going to get us what you actually paid, right? So we can only say this is a lower bound on value. And if we're looking at aggregate measures, it might be difficult to, to disaggregate down to uh, seasons or, or geographic areas or even cohorts in the population. Replacement cost approach. 
What's the basic idea here? Uh, some goods and services provided by natural environments can be replaced by man-made goods and services. What's an example of that? Uh, the water, tr water filtration uh, service provided by a wetland could be replaced with a man-made water filtration uh, system. Uh, the coastal protection value of a reef could be replaced with an artificial man-made breakwater. Right. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to use market-based estimates of the cost of building that replacement service as a proxy for the value of the environmental service, the naturally provided service. Uh, pros on this one, again, it's, it's relatively easy to calculate. We can figure out the construction and engineering costs and say, okay, this is what we would have to spend if that, if that wetland went away. We might have to spend this money uh, to replace that service. And the, the, the estimates are actually easily understood. Uh, replacement cost approach has, uh, has its flaws, has some serious flaws. It's not a true measure of value. Right, in, in sense of gross benefits or even net benefits to people, like we've been talking about value. And, and we all know that man-made alternatives are very unlikely to replace the full range uh, of services provided by the natural environment. Similar uh, approach, the damage avoidance method. Uh, the basic idea here is that the benefits of maintaining healthy systems, uh, clean air, clean water, include not having to spend money on, on other things, uh, human health costs, for example. Right, so we use estimates of the expenditures that would have to be incurred. And I got all my qualifiers in here. Prevent, diminish, avoid, cure, or repair harmful effects. So we might look at the benefits of, say, uh, amendments to the Clean Air Act in terms of reduced health care spending, human mortality and morbidity. Um, not easy to calculate, uh, but the measures are definitely easily understood. Um, and again, not a true measure of value in terms of gross or net benefits to people. Right? Revealed preference techniques. Uh, so now we're into non-market valuation. The basic idea here is that people's behavior in markets uh, might help us understand the value of associated non-market goods. So we need to establish the link between uh, human behavior and changes in natural systems. And the two uh, big categories of revealed preference techniques are the travel cost methods and hedonic pricing. Travel cost method. Uh, basic idea here, and this has a, an interesting history. Um, it goes back to the National Park Service uh, in the 40s. Um, the costs incurred in travel uh, represent a lower bound on unwillingness to pay for access to natural resources. Uh, so we're going to use information on travel expenses uh, as a proxy for price and trip frequency as an estimate of quantity, and we can estimate a trip demand function. If we get that trip demand function, then hopefully we can estimate consumer surplus. We might be able to shift that trip, de trip demand function with changes in quality of the resource and understand the value of lost quality or improved quality at the resource. We're going to collect survey data. Uh, so m most often it's recreation applications, and we're going to collect data from, from recreationists. Uh, we need uh, visit, uh, trip frequency data. We need travel cost uh, measure, and, and typically we can just use a travel distance as a proxy. We can back out a, an expected travel cost if we have travel distance. We need measures of environmental quality at the site, and we need lots of demographic information. In particular, we need income uh, because travel cost can be explicit, gas that you spent or wear and tear on your automobile, but we also have the opportunity cost of time that we want to include in our travel cost measure. So having income data uh, is an important piece of this puzzle. Again, estimating a trip demand function and using that trip demand function to estimate value. Random utility mod modeling is a close cousin of the travel cost model, or a version of the travel cost model. Uh, the standard travel cost model looks at uh, trip frequency at, to a single site, either frequency from a group uh, in an area or frequency by uh, individuals themselves. Right, so you have to get data. How many times did people in a geographic area go to that site? Uh, or how many times did a household go to that site over a, over a period of time, say a year? Um, a, a different way of looking at this choice of site, it's, it's not a frequency de decision, but a uh, decision about where to go. So uh, relatively easy in terms of the cognitive burden on respondents in terms of asking, hey, how many times did you go to that site in the last, in the last year? Or how many times do you expect to go in the future? 
Um, if we can collect data on a single trip occasion at multiple sites, we can model the choice among alternatives, right? If you're going to go recreate at the beach somewhere, you have options about where you can go. Um, part of the reason why you're going to choose a site is, is the cost, right? The travel cost to you, but you're also going to be influenced by quality at the site, environmental quality at the site. So if we have quality measures at multiple sites, if we have travel costs for individuals to alternative sites, we can model the decision across alternatives. It's just uh, uh, logit regression, multinomial logit regression is the tool here. Again, survey data, uh, individual visitation data from different sites, alternative sites. Defining the choice set, what is the group of alternatives that people are choosing from is one of the big questions here. Uh, we use some, some rules of thumb to define choice sets most often. Um, we need to get travel costs and expenditures again. We need to get environmental quality measures at each site. And again, we need demographic information, income being another important variable. Survey data, expensive. Uh, what can we do? What can we derive from a travel cost study or random utility model study? Uh, the value of a visit, the value of an entire area, right? If an area is going to be closed for water quality reasons or fish advisory reasons um, or even inundation, uh, I was involved in a random utility study uh, two summers ago where the Army Corps was changing uh, water levels in a reservoir. Uh, the Nature Conservancy said they wanted to change the water level so that the riparian habitats downstream would be in better shape. Well, they're going to change uh, water release from a dam, which is going to affect recreation on the reservoir. And so we had to do a, a random utility study looking at where people went for camping and fishing and other things and, and how water level in the reservoir was an important variable that influenced uh, where people went to see if, well, okay, we know what the, the benefits are going to be downstream to the natural environment. What are going to be the costs upstream uh, if, if water quality changes for recreationists, water levels change. Hedonic pricing uh, is another revealed preference method. I'm going to talk about it here in terms of house prices, which is probably the most common application, but there are also hedonic wage studies. What's the basic idea here? Um, demand for environmental attributes is often reflected in uh, purchases of houses or salaries. Right? This is an aerial shot of uh, where I live. That's um, the southern tip of Wrightsville Beach Island in, in the foreground there and the northern tip of Masonboro Island. Masonboro Island is a, is a nature preserve. It's about eight miles long. Uh, just beautiful and undeveloped beach. Uh, so houses in this area uh, command a premium, as you might expect, right? Especially those that are closer to the water. People pay more for the environmental amenity. It can be something like proximity to shorelines, proximity to beaches. It could be proximity to parks. It could be air quality, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to collect data on house prices, house transactions. It doesn't have to be sales. It could be leases. Um, but we need a price measure for the houses, and we need lots of house attributes, including environmental attributes. How close are they to the sea? How clean is the air? How close are they to a park? And then we're going to do regression analysis and understand how price is dependent upon all those attributes, including the environmental attribute. The other application of hedonics is to wages. Right? People accept lower wages uh, to live in nice places. Revealed preference models, uh, the methods. Um, the pros are that the estimates, the estimates are grounded in, nat in, in actual behavior. I think given our druthers, we would all choose to work in the world of revealed preference, right? Because we have, uh, we have a defensible estimate. We know you bought that house. We know you took that job. We know you took that trip. And so the estimates are much more defensible. You've read the CVM readings that, that, that we're going to talk about in a couple days. You see there's debate. There's a lot more debate about stated preference methods, which I'm going to talk about soon. Uh, the cons uh, are there's a, you know, a heavy data requirement, the technological knowledge to, to, to do the estimation. Um, we, we're limited to sort of environmental attributes that we can associate with houses or with jobs or recreation, right? So it's not really suitable. These methods aren't really suitable for estimation of non-use values. So stated preference techniques. Uh, the basic idea is that people can tell us what they think. People can tell us what they value. And a variety of ways of getting people to tell us what they value. Uh, what their preferences are. We can ask them what their willingness to pay is or ask them what they're willing to accept. Or we can ask them to make hypothetical choices between alternative goods or alternative states of the world. All right, so two uh, tools in the stated preference uh, technique category are the contingent valuation method and choice modeling. Uh, 
choice modeling. We could also put some, some versions of choice modeling in here, but I, I won't talk about those today. Contingent valuation method, the survey method. Uh, we're going to ask people uh, to tell us what they're willing to pay or willing to accept for uh, changes described in a hypothetical market. We want to get people to participate, uh, at least mentally, in, in a transaction. Hey, would you buy this good? Or how much are you willing to pay for this, for this particular good? So uh, again, survey data. We need a detailed description of a program or change. What could this be? This could be a new marine protected area. This could be, uh, 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 this could be a park. This could be uh, a new policy that's going to reduce emissions. Uh, hey, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna change something. We need a mechanism for uh, eliciting value. That's a, a willingness to pay question. And there's lots of ways to ask the willingness to pay question. This is one of the things that we've been debating for a long time. Do we ask open-ended questions? Hey, how much are you willing to pay? Do we ask closed-ended questions? Are you willing to pay x dollars? Uh, do we follow up the first willingness to pay question with a second willingness to pay question? If you're not willing to pay 10, are you willing to pay 5? If you are willing to pay 10, are you willing to pay 20? We could give people a card that has a bunch of different values and say, which one of these are you willing to pay? And the, the details there um, are debated in the literature. You know, at, at the end of the day, we want to simulate a market transaction. Right? We want to make this like a real market transaction. We need a payment vehicle. How are you going to pay? Your tax is going to go up. Is there going to be a fee added to your electric bill? Are you going to send a check to a conservation agency or a fund? Right? And then we need lots of information on respondent attitudes and characteristics. We need control variables. We need a way to uh, partition value results across, uh, across the population. Here the idea is that we're going to ask people, again, via survey, uh, to choose between different products. Um, and so we describe different products to them. Uh, and this, this method was, was not invented by environmental economists, resource economists. It actually came from the transportation literature and the marketing literature. Right? Um, so you know, think about uh, an auto manufacturer is thinking about you know, adding whatever, leather seats to a particular automobile. And they want to know how much people are willing to pay for leather seats. Well, how do they figure that out? Well, they ask questions, right? ask people questions choose between alternative goods. Uh, one of those attributes needs to be price if we want to do monetary valuation, but we don't have to do monetary valuation. Uh, one of the nice things about choice modeling is that it allows us to understand the relative value of environmental attributes. And I'll show you an example of this in just a second. Um, and again, this is sort of a discrete choice type approach, right? We're modeling how people make choices. So our, it's regression analysis, and our left-hand side variable is zeros and ones. Right? If you chose product A, you get a one, and then two zeros if you could have, could have chosen B and C. Choice modeling is, is, is gaining a lot of favor uh, among those of us that do non-market valuation. Uh, it has a lot of advantages. It recognizes that most environmental goods are composite goods, lots of different attributes with various levels. Um, it allows us to understand the relative importance of different attributes. Uh, we get a lot of data in a single application. And there's a lot of uh, different ways that we can explore preference heterogeneity with, with when you get into the econometrics, the statistics. Here's an example uh, from some of my work. This is a, uh, a choice experiment, a choice model that we did um, in Barbados in 2007. And we were interested in what is the value to tourists of beach width, um, beach proximity for setback regulations, and beach litter for beach cleanup efforts? Right? So how, how much should we spend on x, y, and z, beach nourishment? Uh, how, how, how stringent should we force setback regulations? And how much money should we spend on cleanup uh, in terms of uh, return visitation, in terms of tourism revenues? Right? And so we gave. We, we designed this, this is a five attribute, four level study. So we have five attributes, each with four levels. The, the levels have to be realistic. Um, and they have to be, you know, we want to we wanna have policy relevance on either end, right? So we would like sort of business as usual or status quo to be sort of somewhere in the middle of, of the attribute level so that we can look at change in one direction and we can look at change in the other direction as well. This has five attributes. Obviously, there's a lot more attributes that go into sort of a tourist destination choice. But you have to think about uh, the trade-off between 
realistic description of the, of the goods and cognitive burden on the respondents. Once you put too many attributes into a choice experiment, uh, the, the information overload can, can prevent people from making good choices. So there's a, a balancing act here. But this is what one panel, this is just cut and paste from a, from a questionnaire, this is what one panel in a choice experiment might look like. Now, there's, there's a lot of statistics, econometrics that goes into the design, right? We want to combine attribute levels to maximize the efficiency of estimating uh, the part worths of each of these things. So I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of details here, and there's different ways of doing that. You can randomly assign um, levels to, to, your, uh, to your panels. Uh, you can use a statistical program that's sort of canned. You tell it, uh, this is how many attributes I have. This is how many levels I have. This is the level of confidence that I'm interested in. Or you can you know, write your own code and, and design it yourself uh, using various software packages. But in this particular experiment, each respondent faced six of these choices. So you give, you give them one, A or B or neither. Uh, and then they get another one that's a different card, A or B or neither and so on. Uh, so there was actually 16 versions of those six. So this full, full experiment, we had to get 16 people to take it just to get one time through the experiment. Um, it's important to have an opt-out option, option C. Right? In, in real markets, you're not forced to choose between product A or product B. You always have a choice of, of, of buying neither. And again, the idea is that we're going to regress their choices, do they choose A or B or neither, on the levels of the attributes and hopefully some demographic information as well. Uh, stated preference methods uh, are nice because they allow us to do a lot of things. Um, they're flexible. Um, the, the downside is that it's, it's expensive, right? We've got to get survey data, and, and the technical knowledge is, is a pretty steep learning curve um, about, about how to do the design and how to, how to do the estimation. But, but, but again, the, the nice thing about it is that you don't have to do monetary valuation. Right? We can understand if people are willing to trade walking to the beach for beach cleanliness. Right? Leave the dollars out of it if you want to. Right? So there's a non-monetary measure that you can that you can derive here. Are people willing to walk to the beach if the beach is clean? That's an interesting question. It right? doesn't have anything to do with dollars. OK, so which method is appropriate? It really depends on the situation. It um, depends on what you're interested in valuing. It depends on the intended pur purpose of the value estimates. Is it for policy formation? If the purpose of the valuation estimates is for policy formation, we, we need to have a, a, a higher degree of accuracy. right? And we need to say, OK, well, the policy change is is going to be between here and here, right? We're going to make beaches cleaner. We're going to make beaches wider. And, and we need to incorporate that into the valuation study at, at the beginning. Uh, if the purpose of the valuation work is to just build awareness and you know, ring a bell and say, look how important these resources are, then maybe less uh, accuracy is, is essential, or we don't need as much accuracy. But again, um, we can often use different procedures for valuation. Oftentimes, it's appropriate to use more than one approach. All this is expensive. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, a, a full valuation study, honestly, from start to finish, could take two years, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, it's it's not cheap. What's nice about it is that hey, we can look at hypotheticals. We can do what ifs. We can see the impacts of a policy change before we actually do it. Right? What is the value? What's going to happen if we do this? Ex ante. Um, Obviously, full appraisal of costs and benefits is not going to be the only thing that informs policy. And I know that we had that question this morning. Can you point to valuation studies that have had an effect on policy? Yes, uh, but it's hard to do, right? It's, it's hard to say that, yeah, that valuation study was the definitive factor in designing that policy. There's a lot of things that go into policy formation. This is just one piece. Valuation can call attention to otherwise undervalued resources. We, 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 we talked about that. That can help us understand the economic costs associated with loss, opportunity costs, right? What are we giving up? It can help us understand the economic consequences of mismanagement, right? If we keep going down this path, what are we, gonna, what are we giving up? What are we losing? What are the economic losses? Guide policy in the direction of efficient and or equitable use and create incentives. Sheila's going to talk about incentives that encourage sustainable use, right? Can we use value estimates? to inform incentive-based systems. Without understanding value, I know there's some uh, opposition to valuation. Um, without valuation, conservation efforts might be viewed as too costly. Hey, we can't 
do that conservation project, it sounds nice because if we do so, we'll give up these jobs and revenues. Well, we might learn that the jobs and revenues uh, aren't worth as much as the environment. Now, that's not to say that valuation is advocacy. It's, it's not um, because we might find out that the jobs and revenues are actually higher than the economic, the value of the economic services, right? Again, cold-hearted search for the truth, right? We're not, we're not trying to say that the environment is always worth more conserved than when used. Well, sometimes it is. It's an empirical question. Signals. We don't say should very much. And here's some things that maybe economists agree on, right? We had a few of those this morning. Market prices should incorporate economic costs that are external to the market. Public accounts should include stocks and flows of natural capital and their values. Public policy should reflect the values of the public. Valuation helps us do all this stuff. Signals, proper signals, right? If you want to think, why we have these problems? Well, maybe we're not getting the right signals. There are low-cost approaches. We talked about some qualitative approaches. There are some quantitative lower-cost approaches. I'm um, not going to talk too much about meta-analysis or benefits transfer, but those are out there and available. Um, there are benefits transfer, but let me just say, be very careful. Um, if you're going to use benefits transfer, the basic idea there is to take values estimated at a study site and transfer them to a policy site, some other site. And there's lots of ways to do that. Um, it's really only useful and, and valid when the study site and the policy site have a lot in common, uh, biologically, sociology, sociolo sociologically. Um, they have to have a lot in common for us to do that benefits transfer. Obstacles to valuation. There are many. Uh, lack of technical capacity might be the big one. Budget's obviously big. There might be legal impediments, uh, political. Uh, pol politicians have to put their cards on the table, right? If you commission a valuation study and then you get the results, then you're faced with saying, you know, def defending your decision if it goes against what the, the valuation uh, study says. And then there's moral opposition. Some people are just opposed to trying to assign monetary values to natural resources. And to that opposition, I always say, well, we're, we're kind of doing valuation anyway. Um, we're just not making the values explicit in dollar terms, right? When, when we spend money on one program and don't spend money on environmental programs, we are, as a society, saying that we value that other program more than we value the environment. And we, we do it at an individual level, a very micro level. When you run your air conditioner for your own comfort and convenience, you are saying that you value your own comfort and convenience more than you value the damage that you're doing to the environment from the air pollution that you're causing. So we're doing valuation implicitly every day, all the time, in the way we act and what we do, right? how we live. All we're doing here is, is trying to make it more explicit, representing it in, in dollar terms. All right, gaps and unknowns. Um, you know, despite the fact that valuation has been going on for, you know, three or four decades, um, the approach is still sort of piecemeal and, and lacking a common unit of measure. Valuation studies can report results in a lot of different ways uh, per trip value, consumer surplus estimates, uh, individual willingness to pay, individual willingness to accept. Sometimes they aggregate up to an ecosystem level. Sometimes we aggregate up to a national level. And it's really hard, even though we're all in dollars, there, there are different versions of those dollars. And, and, and it makes, makes it difficult to make comparisons across time, across space. So wh what do we need? And this is not just me who says this. this is, there's a lot of people who are advocating this sort of approach. Um, the economics comes in sort of at the end. Um, we need to understand the ecology, the biophysical relationships that transfer into hu changes in human well-being before we can do the valuation, before we can get the valuation part right. Uh, so what do we need to do? Um, model ecological, biophysical processes that, that translate ecosystem services into measurable indicators that are amenable to economic valuation. Uh, for example, how does, how does a particular policy affect ecosystem structure and function? How does that translate into changes in ecosystem services? And how does that translate into measurable benefits from people? Only at the end does the valuation come in. All this other work needs to take place first. Otherwise, we're just valuing something that we really don't understand. What are some measurable benefits indicators? There, there are many, and here's just sort of off the top of my head, fisheries output, right? That could be catch rates. Um, incidence of health effects, beach width, 
likelihood of, of storms or storm damage, encounters with specific species, encounters with specific habitats, tourism visits, probability of a discovery, right? Economists can take a hold of this and, and try to assign a monetary value to it, right? But we need to know how that changes and why that changes before we can do it, before we can say, okay, here's the policy implication. So the prerequisites are consistent and accurate measurement of environmental conditions, right? The baseline and the change. What are the relationships? Uh, here's just sort of a, an example of a development project. Hey, we're, there's going to be this development project. Should it happen, yes or no? If we want to do a cost-benefit analysis, how might we do that full-blown cost-benefit analysis? Well, there's lots of impacts, right? The project might change beach access. Okay, we, can, we could probably tackle that right there with, with some valuation, maybe a random utility model. Uh, but then there's going to be some runoff, and the runoff's going to lead to damage to a reef and, and lower water quality. Okay, well, there's, there's a relationship that economists aren't going to tackle, right? Somebody else has got to do that part. Um, the reef damage is going to lead to loss of tourists. Okay, we can grab a hold of that one, but it's also going to lead to loss of fish. No, that's not a, we can't do that one. We need somebody else to tell us how does runoff lead to reef damage, how does reef damage re lead to loss of fish. Decreased water quality, how does runoff and water quality relate, right? Okay, and once we know the decreased water quality, then we can chart, start to assign start to assign values to it. So it, it really is an interdisciplinary approach that is needed, and, it, and it's a lot of modeling that's needed. And again, we get this sort of catch-22, right? We want accuracy, which means detailed models. Uh, detailed models are going to introduce more uncertainty, more uncertainty built into the system, then maybe we're going to get more uncertainty at the end. So we want to be simple and accurate both at the same time, and that's a tough trick to pull off. But I think this is where we need to go. Uh, education, finally, just to finish up. Education of the general public is also a, sort of a co-requisite to all of this. Right? It's not just policymakers that need to be informed of the economic value of natural resources and changes in natural resources. It's general public as well. Yeah, there we go. Thank you very much. <laughs>